Hello and welcome to Shoot the Breeze, where we take a nostalgic look at a random football magazine from the past. I'm Andy Smith, aka Scott's Footy Cards on Twitter, and with me is Tom Brogan. Hello. In each episode, we'll invite a special guest to join us in trawling through the magazine and discuss anything contained within it. This could be anything from an article, to a photograph, to a competition, to an advert. Basically, if it's in it, then we'll talk about it. So sit back and let's shoot the breeze. Wriggles clear. Might just get the chip and he does. He's scored! Oh, what a great back And this week our guest is Mark Gardner. Mark is a musician and a music producer, uh, probably best known as being the front man for the band Ride. Thanks for coming on, Mark. Uh, pleasure. You're welcome. Nice to, thanks for taking me back down memory lane on this one. <laughs> yeah, so that's what we're looking at is a match from uh, the 26th of April, 1986. And uh, the cover page, uh, the headline is You Beauties. And mm. it's uh, Captain Fantastic, Malcolm Shotton and goal hero Ray Houghton milk the applause of the Oxford fans after the U's 3-0 Wembley victory over Queen's Park Rangers. Uh, so this is, of course, Oxford United winning the Milk Cup. And uh, also in the magazine, carrying on from that, exclusive Milk Cup final action. Soonest, Laird the Rybrooks, also in colour, Terry Butcher, Tony Gale, Richard Goff, John Motson's Mexico Marvels, Salute to Super Swindon, and uh, cover price, 42 pence, uh, Singapore, $2.25. I mean, you got all the greats on this one, but why why, why on this one do we have salute to Super Swindon? <laughs> What's all that about? I guess that's, they're like, I kind of like, that's the big rivalry. Also, Swindon is really bad. That's your Newcastle, Sunderland, your, your Rangers, Celtic, mm. and perhaps not quite that. Well, actually, probably as much hatred in that one as well. But yeah, so it's weird that they've managed to get on the cover here as well. Maybe that's someone winding us up or something. I don't know. Is it is it a tradition for that? Is it geographical or, or is it a particular? It's, it's geographical because it's really close to Oxford. And I think historically there was a lot of trouble between the clubs and a lot of kind of, well, we felt dodgy results. And uh, I mean, and back back in those days when, when people used to go to football to fight, there was a lot of fighting between uh, those fans. And yeah, I mean, it, it's just so close to Oxford and it, it still goes on today. I mean, it, it's... It's, it's a big one. Yeah, it's a real big one, that. Um, so yeah. you've, you've been cutting that bit out to pin this up, <laughs> your, up your wall? I would. That, would. that would have to be blanked out big time. Yeah. That, that's, <laughs> Swindon on there. That's where the tax go, isn't it? That's where the pins go, right, on that. Exactly. Bit. Yeah, Yeah. exactly, yeah. I think, I think Tom, I, I think you'll you maybe touch on it, but I think it's because they're the first team to be promoted this season. Is that right? Swindon, I think that's what that... Uh, maybe, yeah, yeah. maybe. Um, that could actually be when Glenn Hoddle was managing them as well. I think it was Lou McCary is is there. Ah, Lou McCary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They had a few that went through there. Yeah. Oh, I don't really care about the end of the day, You know what I mean? It's yeah. Just, but, forget but, about it. <laughs> uh, so, Mark, would you have been buying match or shoot? Uh, run, run about this this time. Shoot. I remember buying shoot. Um, yeah, de- I definitely would have had some shoots knocking about. I mean, I. Yeah, uh, no, I don't. I don't remember the match so well, but I, but it's possible. But I do like seeing that you beauties. I would have seen that. I, I, it did kind of you know to bring about because I'd have, on that week I would have probably bought everything <laughs> that that had Oxford United over it, as well as probably a subute, another Subutio team with Oxford United on it as well. Mind you, I was sixteen then, so I was probably <laughs> just about grow, growing out of Subutio by that point. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'd also I'd spent. I was thinking about it. I'd spent the month leading up to this um, because it it, obviously I went to the match. I was there, um, but I spent the month uh, making a big banner, a big flag, which had a sort of St. George's cross. But then I'd put a Union Jack in one corner, not realizing that I'd basically then, you know, made an Irish flag. Um, And then I'd put I'd put an ox in one corner and then in sort of graffiti writing because I was kind of into hip hop. Then I'd sort of put Oxford United in sort of groovy writing and that, and I just was draped in that when I went to the game. <laughs> well, well, Andy, will we go into the, the magazine well, then? I, I just want to just talk about the, so the, the photograph, um, what I love about cup finals is 
and, and I can't really think of the other ones off the top of my head, but stupid headwear that winners end up <laughs> when, you know, what, they, you, what could you possibly mean? Yeah. And it's <laughs> like, <the> ox. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it's like, and then, and then you're photographed and, and that's for, for eternity. You're wearing that yeah. hat and that great moment. And I just love, you know, you, you'll see them with the big, the big caps and the big um, long hats and things like that. And I just, yeah. you know, it seems to be a, I don't, I, I don't know if it's been deliberately done, but it seems to be a bit of a tradition. It's, you know, it, it's it's funny also because on that day, I remember because obviously uh, at, at those times we had the old VHS recorders, and my dad obviously was was my late dad who got me into Oxford United because he was a trustee of the youth team. Hmm. So from six years old, I was going up to the to the to the ground, and he, he was obviously there as well. But. Um, I remember the, the coverage and Jim Rosenthal, you, remember, you know, the football commentator that used to be on a lot, actually a lot of football. He suddenly donned out one of those hats on the commentary and sort of went, well, this is it. I'm not hiding it anymore. I'm an Oxford United supporter too and put one of those hats on. So yeah. I really, I mean, I really remember that from the, you know, the official uh, the footage or whatever the channel was that, that filmed it at the time, which of course we reran a lot of times just to watch it over and over as you do when, Oxford United won, just won the milk cup, yeah. yeah. And to see if I could pick out my banner as well in the crowd. <laughs> yeah, you, you always you always look for yourself whenever, <laughs> yeah, whenever you've been banner, again. You know, it's it's got to be there somewhere. There's only like, I mean, and actually, because Oxford's so close to Wembley, it's the first time I went to Wembley, but we, every time Oxford have been to Wembley, I mean, that was obviously the first time um, we take a lot of fans up there. I mean, it was, it, it, we, you know, it was like 40 odd. I mean, I remember thinking that. It's like, Oxford's like, 10,000 people go to the ground normally or, you know, on a, on a good day and in the packed little man of ground. I mean, actually then it was maybe 12,000 because we were in and around the, what was the old premiership. But I was thinking, where do all these people come from? You know, where, why aren't you, why aren't this, why isn't this club not bigger? And why, yeah. why are we, who are all these people that suddenly are supporting Oxford? But I think it's just families of fans and everybody. So it's literally just sort of an hour down the road, really. Yeah. So what was it like, um, in Oxford, that it was all the bunting out and things like that, and I think I don't. I mean, I mean, I remember I mean, my mum was saying that Oxford on that day obviously was deserted because yeah. literally everyone had gone to Wembley, and I think I think they did they did do a, uh, I think the bunting came out afterwards because I think I think I remember them doing uh, a, a kind of wave from the yeah. Oxford Town Hall, right. so that and so afterwards the the fans sort of packed into the city centre to kind of you know celebrate again milk it literally <laughs> um so yeah i mean so but yeah i i mean the thing is with oxford it's quite you know oxford united is is was always a bit outside that city you know the city center of oxford is really university mm. so and town and gown so you don't it didn't really cater for football but i think just on that occasion the, the fans just packed the, the city center as well yeah. Um, so yeah, they, they they wouldn't be putting up yellow and blue bunting because it wasn't connected to a college, you, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Tom, you want to go in? Yeah, aye. So we just to turn the page then. So I, I guess, Mark, this is so Oxford. This is the first season, the first division, and they've won the third division. Then they won the second division, and then they get into the, into the first. Mm -hmm. uh, so you 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 were going regularly in that that period. I, I went to every game, and I was going away quite a lot then as well. I mean, that was my first experiences of touring, really, <laughs> um, which which I was, I was a member of what it was called the London Road Club because the London Road was the end behind the goal that I used to stand in. I mean, I used to be on the side with my dad and then I was like, you yeah, know, I'm a teenager now. I want to go yeah. with all the mad kids behind the goal. And it was mad behind there. It's fantastic. And um, so, yeah, I mean, the, yeah, that, 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 that was it really um so i yeah I, at that time i was i was a member of the london road club and you know my fight you know i was i was basically getting on the bus uh, on saturday early and we we you know go in to all the different grounds i mean and i've been doing that for probably a few years leading up to that because obviously we were on the whole promotion charge um so i saw lots of yeah a lot, that's the way i first sort of started to see the, the you know the country really from places as sort of rough as Newport was at that time, you know, to some of the first division grounds. Um, and I remember going to Main Road and places like that because I always kind of liked Man City when I was a kid as well because I just liked the light blue strip. So, you, you know, I'm at Goodison Park. I mean, just, yeah, all, all the big grounds. And I mean, that that was the way 
like I say, I saw the country and saw a lot of those grounds, which of course I was a real football kid and I, you know, I'd read all about grounds and, you know, and my dad was really heavily into football. So, uh, you know, we always match the day. It was always a thing for, for us. So yeah, it, it just felt amazing that it was Oxford United in there doing it. And I mean, I mean, you know, also this, I think it was that season that Alex Ferguson first started managing Man United and they his first game in charge of Man United famously came to Oxford United and we yeah. beat them 2-1. <laughs> and, and, you know, all the Man U people, even then, would call him, who, Alex Ferguson, who is this guy? He's got to go. We've <laughs> lost. We've just been beaten by Oxford. Yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, but Oxford were really good at that time. We had some great players and we were a great team. I mean, look, looking there, yeah. Ray Houghton, for starters. I mean, Ray Houghton and Trevor Hebb had totally bossed that game at Wembley. Um, and we obviously, John, John Aldridge, Oh, I wonder why had John Aldridge gone to Liverpool by that point. Maybe oh, he was he was he was playing. Yeah, mm. he was part of the team. Oh, he did play. Okay, because yeah, I well, saw. I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just read out the eleven for you, Mark. So it's Alan Judge, David Langan, yeah. John Trevick, Les Phillips, Gary Briggs, Malcolm Shaw, and Ray Houghton, John Aldridge, Jeremy Charles, Trevor Hebert, and Kevin Brock. That's it. So so Aldridge was still there, but Aldridge didn't score did he say? So and it was Jarrett. Jer- um, was who scores at Hebert House and, Charles, and Jeremy Charles? Yeah. That was Jeremy Charles. That's right. Yeah, I, I think it. I think it was um, Aldridge that shot for the third goal and it was saved, and Charles just tapped it. That's in, right. It? Yeah, that's right. But the one I really remember that broke the deadlock was the Trevor Hebert goal, and I'm that seeing him in that picture was was is really I, that that I just know that so well that how he you know that he that's a proper guy that's about to kick a ball <laughs> going in there it's really got the pose there yeah. um but yeah I, I mean and i'm yeah just that that really was that it, it, as soon as that happened it was unbelievable it's like we, we could actually do this because i cause i think qpr I would have been favorites i think on, on the day i, well, hmm. I mean that, that sort of time i mean coming up through the leaks into the the first division then winning the milk cup you must have just thought that was that was how it was going to be for forever and never and never. It, yeah, in a way, I, I guess because what at that age, what you don't quite understand is what was going on in the background, hmm. and of course, the background was Robert Maxwell, yeah. and you know, topical topical now for bad reasons, obviously because of his daughter being locked up and Epstein and all that scenario, and she used to come to the ground with dad. Um, at times, because they also, uh, at certain times, I remember there was a big riot because he suddenly thought one day he had this great idea that he was going to merge Oxford and Reading together and call them the Thames Valley Royals. And it was like, it was just, I think I was on the pitch. Everyone was like, that's not happening, mate. And, um, but yeah, I, did, I just didn't realize that actually, I mean, you, you wouldn't really, that, that obviously he, Jim Smith he brought in, which is ironic because Jim mm. Smith wasn't was managing QPR on this team but it was obviously Jim Smith that helped you know get us up the leagues and obviously he was well backed by Maxwell at that time with his dodgy pension money and whatever other dodgy money he was getting into um and yeah it was it was amazing I mean we we it's just I, I could yes I mean because I also I had seen them I knew you know from six years old I was going up there so I, I knew about watching Oxford on cold yeah, you know, sat on the wall. Some you know pretty t- dreadful games, really. Um, but I, I I understood the rise and what it meant. I could see what it meant to my dad and you know the whole club. It was just really really amazing what happened on on because I think it was it's consecutive promotions and yeah. before we knew it, yeah, we were in the top league and playing all the top clubs and that that was yeah, it was phenomenal really. And what was what was the minor grounds like? It's funny because since. I mean, it was it was small. It was just, still had some cow sheds in there. I think you realise that for opposing teams to come to it is horrible. I mean, they you could see why it, it wasn't helping. It, it was it was great for us. The home advantage thing re- you felt really played a part because it was intense. It was really you're really close to the pitch. It was small. It, it was it, the you know the atmosphere in there was was off off the chart at times. It was crazy because it, it was it just had that feel about it and you know there were different sort of sheds and it was it was a bit higgledy piggledy I mean the, the main stand was okay uh on the side but other than that and, and the London road behind the goal but like the cuckoo lane end where the where the away fans came to was all open I think the infrastructure around the ground wasn't great either so there was 
there was frequently sort of trouble that broke out because they couldn't really separate fans very well outside. And it was just a very residential area that what, you know, the whole place was not set up for first division football. And it's funny because since, since that time, I, I, along the way, I bumped into people like Luther Blissett or ex footballers and chatted to them. And they were like the ground, they all said, you know, people, many players have said they hated coming to play. It was the manor ground. It sort of had a style. And also because it was the manor ground and, um, Briggs and Shotton, who notoriously just kicked people, and you know they were, oh, they were great. I mean, they 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 were effective. I, they would not have got away with it now with VAR, but at the time, I think I think the combination of the ground and those players, uh, certainly hearing from from a few other you know opposed players and opposing teams, they also said Oxford was a dreadful place to go to. <laughs> So, well, I think uh, Andy and I remember Malcolm Shorten because he had a couple of years with Air United. So he was up, oh, right, yeah, up of course. in Scotland, so early 92 to 94, I think. Mm-hmm. And I think he'd made quite an impression up here with the Air fans as well. Again, it's well, no nonsense. Uh, yeah. Defending. Yeah, you know, and, and I guess looking at him there, I mean, it didn't probably get any higher for him. I mean, obviously the promotions, but I mean, that was a massive high point for him in his career, I think. I can't. Think he would have really topped that, um, like I said, you know, along with the promotions. But he was good. Yeah, he was. He was really good. Yeah, and obviously Solid. the Heysel ban robbed Oxford of getting into Europe through winning. The, they should have got yeah UEFA Cup place by winning. That, the league. That's right, and that was the thing that I mean, I was very aware of that at the time, which felt very a bit un, un, very unjust because. Yeah, it was that. That was yeah, not fair in a way. But but there we go. That that was where where it was at. And I, and I remember a lot of people talking about that at the time because obviously for a smaller club like Oxford and um, maybe Matt, so I was running out of people's pension money towards that time. I don't know, but that that would have helped the club as well because I mean, I mean you know it was soon. I guess that was a high point, and then of course, not long after that, we we did we started falling back down the league the leagues really. Anything else you remember from that from that day, Mark? Well, I mean, so much in a way. It, it, it was it was up there with. I can't remember a better day in my life up until that point. It was it was incredible, and I mean, I I also remember. So at that time, I worked in a local pub. I lived just outside Oxford City in a little village called Horton Come Studley, and uh, I kind of got to know sort of through. I was I was collecting glasses and I worked at the hotel in the village so I was like a glass collector then you know I was too young then to serve behind the bar but I went on to that big promotion there <laughs> um but oh yeah it's basically collecting glasses. so I got to know some of the yokel locals who were really yokel and a lot of these guys were, were farm workers um who, who were working the land literally in Oxfordshire so they kind of took me under their wing a little bit because they knew I was a big Oxford fan as were they and um, so I used to go in with these guys, uh, you know, obviously I used to go with my dad initially and then for the away games, some of the away games when I wasn't on the coaches, I'd go with these guys and they were a rough lot. So I, in a way it was good because I was pretty protected because it was always a little bit edgy uh, mm-hmm. at that time. Football, you never know, you, you never really knew, you didn't feel completely safe. It was always a bit, you know, there was quite a lot of fighting going on and stuff. Um, but these guys were just like, I was kind of like, had this entourage by like, these tough sort of farm boys who were like, no one's messing with these guys at all. And if they do, they'd be crazy because these guys just didn't care about anything. They were like, you know, they were proper kind of farm land workers, really tough and rough guys, but but lovely, you know, heart of gold kind of people. And um, yeah, for me, you know, I'm sort of teenager, 15, 16, starting to really enjoy life. I mean, and this this was a, a, a massive high point for me, for sure. And uh I, yeah, I, I, yeah. It was. It was just, and also, it, it, like I said, it was the first time I'd been to the old Wembley. I mean, and joking, I used to say to people, "I'll go to Wembley when Oxford get there for years," you know. And um, I mean, I still say that. And actually, we've been there four times with with different competitions now. But yeah, it, it was it, yeah phenomenal. And like I say, I, I, that video the, of the game, I, I, yeah, I watched that a good few times. So, and kids at your school, Mark, would they have been Oxford fans or would they have been supporting like, London clubs or anything before Oxford got into the first? A few, a very few of them would, but that was the that was the point for me. 
was that I was probably one of the more rare kids in Oxford that supported Oxford because a lot of other kids were like, oh, Liverpool, Arsenal. There's quite a lot of Arsenal fans, which really wound me up because it wasn't so far from London. So maybe their dads would take them to, to Arsenal and, and all of this. And it's like, you support your local team, guys. You know, it's like we're, we're having it. We're doing beating big teams. And um, but yeah, so yeah, I, I, I think it, it wasn't like, I was surrounded by lots of lots of fans at school, just a, just a, a very few people, basically. Um, yeah, like you're right. It was, you know, people at school always kind of were trying to support the big clubs, which mm-hmm. is, you know, should I point it out? Well, you know, you're not, if you a proper supporters actually go to the game and watch the team, you don't just, that's a Liverpool fan, you've never even been to the ground. Come on. <laughs> Tom, Tom, I don't know if that, was that a loaded one based on something later on claim to fame? No. I don't know if you saw that one, so we'll get to it, but there's um, somebody writes in and says, I'm the only person in my school that supports Fulham. So there's somebody writing in the magazine to tell them that that's their claim to fame, the only, only person, so I thought you were maybe going yeah. along those. Uh, yeah. No, no, but I, I did feel like that guy at school at yeah. that time, for sure, yeah. So well, both uh, both, sorry, both Andy and I are Clay Bank supporters, uh, and again... Right. It, Clay Bank, I guess, kind of similar to Oxford. We get into the Premier League around about that time, mid eighties, and uh, our grounds sort of, were that at the time ten thousand. And again, we're close to Glasgow, and most people at school supported Celtic or Rangers, and then yeah. Dundee United, Aberdeen, who were successful at the time as well. So there's very right. few people who supported the local club, and even now, there's you know most people support Celtic or Rangers here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is, I I appreciated. The big teams and like i say I, I would have collected the panini football stickers i was you know i was all over it i still am really i still absolutely all over football love it so uh, i i could appreciate and I, yeah like i said I like, I like to watch the, the clubs on match of the day and you know as I, I still do but that's my team was also that was it i was taken there early and it feels so much better when you do get a success like this with 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 a club like that um yeah it, i think it it means it just meant so much more because it was unexpected. It, it it was, and it was, it was kind of, you know, I mean, like an indie football club in a way. I mean, I, I sort of see football a little bit like indie in a musical way, like indie and majors, you know, and it also were definitely, it was definitely indie at that point. And uh, they, they came good on the, you know, they won on their own terms and they, they were great. I mean, they, they took on the big boys and, and they beat them at their own game. And um, yeah, that, that, that feels extra special. Uh, but it didn't feel so good afterwards when we started sliding back down. And yeah. then you, and, and the thing is, the whole Max thing kind of unraveled the club for a while because, of course, after that, uh, people didn't want to touch the club because there's probably so much financial mismanagement and, and dodgy dealing that had been going on. And with Maxwell, then sort of suddenly career well went overboard uh, on over, over the side of the boat, uh, which we don't know really now if that was. Him doing that, or if you, I, I, who knows yeah, what, yeah. what you know what that guy was into. But um, yeah, so I think for years after that, it was really difficult because people just didn't want to touch or come near the club um, because there was just so many, so much you know dodgy dealings that had gone on. I guess that people needed to wait for all of that to sort of clear up. Um, yeah. So, so I'm looking. I'm looking at the the kit here, and it is a it is a very nice kit. Would you have had Beautiful. the cup? I mean, I'm guessing you would have had that kit, but would you have had the cup yeah. version of it? And do, uh, do you I, still I, have I, it? I had. I did have. I I still have that. I have that Wang Oxford shirt. I bought quite a lot of the shirts. Um, yeah, I would. I, I I would have had that. I don't think I wore it on the day though. I I would have worn. And also, top. I, I can't remember what I was wearing, but like I said, I was a bit of a sort of hip hop boy then, so I might have had my like feel a tracksuit or whatever on with tracksuit top and probably an ultra shirt underneath. But yeah, it, it's yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? Look at it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a very very thick blue blue stripe up at the collar. I mean, that that's yeah. unusual. You don't normally see them that thick. Um, yeah. And the whole yeah, thing, Wang, Wang computer. That's right. Wang was a computing. Yeah. Uh, for I think early computers, probably like a bit like Sinclair or something like that. I think yeah. if I remember right. Yeah. I was going. I was going to say about Wang so, because now, 
it's a bit of a comedy name, but I don't remember. I think is it's an Americanism, isn't it? It's something that Americans have introduced. Wang. I think. Wang, yeah. So I yeah, think at that, right, yeah. at that time, I don't think the, you know, the person in the street would have associated that with what we now no. associate it with. Uh, yeah, yeah, I bet. I guess, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It looks pretty dodgy when you look at it like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although, you know, the game with Max is so involved, he knows. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> he could have been on to a lot of other things that we didn't know about at the time. <laughs> uh, we turn the page then, uh, yeah. Andy, and we're, we're still at uh, the Milk Cup final. So Hebbard's the hero, so it's still, yeah. still on a repeat, so the milk, on the Milk Cup final. And, of course, Morris Evans, yeah, the manager. That's, so I think he was Jim Smith's assistant initially when Jim Smith was there. And then I remember Morris Evans just it seemed to get landed the job when Jim Smith left. Um, and he was quite a, a bit of a sort of wet character from what I remember. Um, whereas Jim Smith was edgy. I mean, you really felt you were going places with Jim Smith, but it, it was, yeah, which, which actually made it all the more surprising that we, we did win in that way, but, you know, with, with Morris Evans, but obviously he got them, got them really up for it. Um, I mean, and maybe, I guess, thinking about it, I guess some of the players that after Jim had gone and Jim had obviously brought a lot of those players in, maybe there was a bit of an axe to grind there with some of them as well. I'm, I'm not sure what happens there, but um, but yeah, brilliant. I mean, Houghton, what, what a player. Ray Houghton was there, he is with the car. He, absolute legend. I mean, of course, I remember then the Republic, the Great Republic of Ireland, the, I saw that Jack Charlton program recently, mm, yeah. and of course, when they beat it, Italy was it, and the, the Aldridge, Aldridge couldn't get on the pitch, and there's Houghton. <laughs> I just, I mean, it's some phenomenal, phenomenal player. It was so good. Yeah. yeah, I know, absolutely. I was one that Scotland missed, missed out on, you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the run to the cup final as well, I was looking back at that, and it was an impressive run. Um, started off yeah. Northampton over two legs, 4-1. Then Newcastle beat 3-1. Norwich beat 3-1, Portsmouth beat 3-1, uh, semis yeah. against Aston Villa, 4-3 uh, in aggregate. So, I mean, it was... I was a, I went to that. I was. A, I went to the... I would have gone to a few of the those away legs, but I definitely remember being at Villa Park for the first time. And I remember John Aldridge did a little dodgy sort of move on the penalty. So, it, it kind of feigned to go one way and put it another, which was... Supposedly, I mean the the keeper was complaining a lot about it, but yeah, um, yeah again, I, I I really remember that, and that was amazing being at Villa Park and just then suddenly going. So what? We're going to Wembley? It's <laughs> just unbelievable. What's going on? Yeah. But yeah, brilliant, brilliant, and and again, that was another tick one I ticked off Villa Park because I've not I've not been there before. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing QPR must have fancied themselves though, because obviously with Jim Smith, he thinks he knows this team inside out. And they beat Liverpool yeah. in the semi over two legs as well. So oh well, they did, they did. Yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. And, and I mean, I think absolutely. And they were they were strong at, at that time. And but I, they just didn't show up on the day. It was strange. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think it was fairly even until, like, say, Hebbard scored the goal. Then it just seemed like this is only going to go one way. Um, but I mean, I'm reading some of the bits. Of, like, yeah, I mean, Jim's was saying it was their kind of worst performance of. of you know, for a while and what have you and um yeah it was it was strange because and I, th I i really remember the time we we were the underdogs um but yeah um we we completely bossed it really and like i say it was it just seemed to be again everything was going through how and um hebbard and, and i think old oldridge as well now thinking about it, it was always a sort of goal threat so i think it, yeah it, we, we we had them worried all the way <laughs> Yeah, he was class, John Aldridge, everywhere he went. He was a great Yeah. Player. I think, I mean, it was Liverpool he went to after all, so wasn't it? And I, I remember a couple of times I was doing, so I did geography at school. I just did sort of did a geography A-level and, and part of my, as you would, part of, I did a, I did the project on relocating the Manor Ground Stadium, Oxford United. <laughs> And uh, as and, you know, obviously, like, right, find something you're passionate about. It's going to make it a lot more interesting for a geography A level. And I remember kind of going around the ground, the old ground, with my sort of notebook or whatever, and actually walking into John Aldridge. It obviously just yeah. finished training, and I was like, oh, "Wow, it's John Aldridge!" And uh, so I actually said, "Look," and I just, I just thought, "Oh, brazen!" I was like, "Oh, I've got to go and speak to him." So I like John. I'm, 
I'm yeah, I'm doing a study for about relocating <laughs> Oxford United's ground, and uh, I could ask you a few questions about what you feel about this. Of course, he doesn't probably give a shit at that point because he's about to go off to Liverpool anyway, I guess. So, um, but he was really cool. He sort of talked to me for a while about it, and um, yeah, and I, I just, yeah, just thought, what a guy, what a player, and and also just so many of those games at that time. It was uh, John Aldridge and Billy Hamilton was the other guy. Mm who, I don't know, maybe he was injured or he'd left before this had happened, but uh, that combination, very different sort of players, but a lot of games, but those two were just absolutely on fire and, and brilliant. Like, I Billy Hampton was a completely different sort of player to Aldridge, but I remember seeing him beat Arsenal and it, it, they were just, yeah, it was absolutely amazing. Um, but yeah, it was kind of like just meant everything to them. Yeah. Um, you just got that feeling they were absolutely loving it and, and just just yeah beating all the big boys it, it felt great mm. I, 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 think I was going to sorry Andy so I think I was I was going to say but three weeks after Wembley uh, Oxford beat Arsenal on the last day of the season three nothing at the manor ground to stay up that's right we stayed up and then that was the following season that, that's it yeah um and I would have been I would have, I was there I would have been at that one as well and that again that would have been against the odds I'm think so the 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 Arsenal one that I remember I think that was actually on one of the cut runs as well with Aldridge when he scored the late goal or whatever but um that one sticks in my memory more but yeah I, I that's right now you say that I kind of I'm I'm time traveling back there and I'm thinking <laughs> oh yeah I was definitely there I remember that and yeah I mean great yeah beating Arsenal three 0 there we go I was just going to, I was going to say there that um I was so pleased to hear your story about John Aldridge there because this is a bit of a theme through a lot of our podcasts where we talk about how it doesn't take much for a footballer to make a little bit of an effort to make a big difference to somebody's life, just whether they actually sign something, they say hello, they, they pose for a photograph. It's the ones who don't yeah. take the effort or just ignore or are rude. And just for that second, they might be in a bad mood, but for that second or those couple of seconds, that just makes a lasting impression on on a youngster. So I'm glad to hear. Yeah, absolutely, no, and he, yeah, I like to say, really, really cool guy. I mean, I mean, it was also what when I when I'm thinking about it, the pub that I worked at and collected glasses, there was another Oxford hero that actually owned the pub, and yeah. he was called Hugh Curran, an Oxford oh, United yeah. striker. He scored a lot of goals for yeah. Oxford. He played for Wolves. Mm. Um, he was the he was. So obviously he retired at that point and you know ran the pub you know in, in the Horton Camp study. So he was like my kind of employer. So on a couple of occasions he'd got the in also to go to some of the the bigger games. And so I'd, I was driven by him and Nick Harris, who's still an Oxford United radio uh, commentator, still going strong actually. And so so it was myself, Hugh Curran, Nick Harris, and. Hugh Curran's son, Ian Curran. Um, so I remember we went up to see uh, Oxford Everton, a Goodison part. I went up with those, which is kind of terrifying because looking back on it, I think Hugh Curran was permanently drunk. Um, and and then I, I sort of realised when we were on, in this car, I'm thinking, because we, we, we nearly hit three coaches on the way up and it was just like, whoa, this is a bit hair-raising, this one. But, um, but yeah, I, again... I've kind of got a little bit of an in with, with those guys. And I remember being at Goodison Park with them and getting backstage or whatever, so to speak, you know, inside and, and meeting a few people um, and then, you know, kind of being out of So we kind of got a little bit of special treatment occasionally with, with those guys when I wasn't with my farmer boys, the tractor boys or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that Hugh Curran's keeping up the Scottish stereotype of the drunken man. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, of course, yeah, yeah, because yeah, it, um, it was it was classic. I think I worked with it, worked for him. I was fourteen, maybe when I first started working at that pub collecting glasses, and I probably worked there for two years. And he he still didn't know my name. He was just all, I don't know why he just always kept calling me Keith. I remember it well. I was like, I'm, Hugh, I'm Mark. And he's like, All right, Keith, get, you know, get the glasses. Get the yeah, sorry about the bad Scottish thing, but it, it was like. Keith, you know, and I was like, Keith, who is Keith? Like, why did you call him Keith and Mark? Yeah. And um, but he was he was a proper character. And of course, I remember the 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 cellar at the pub used to flood quite regularly when there'd right. been a lot of rain. And of course, you know, he he'd kind of be in his nice trousers and you know, kind of yeah, nice sort of footballer wear, yeah, it's footballer. He looked pretty smart, you current, and also his 
daughters were, was, his daughter was gorgeous. I had a big crush on her. And, um, but he'd be like, yeah, no, no problem. And he'd just be like down in his, in his far, you know, nice trousers in there. And he sort of, he'd spend the rest of the night with his sort of big wet mark on the top of his knee, you know, ah, it's just a bit of a flood. And like, that's the rest of his night, you know, oh, it's yeah. just, so that pub, it's funny, it was called the King's Arms pub at Hawking House Study. That was fine. That's like my first kind of one of my early jobs, just collecting glasses, basically. Mm. Um, for him, it's, yeah, it's fun. It's definitely, you know, that, like I said, that was quite a revealing time into sort of, drinking and drinkers and yeah i used to have a little lager and lime and now and again they stick a vodka in there and whatever but there we go do you know what um if you give me a wee second i have a photograph of his daughters would you, <laughs> you like kidding? to see it no let, let me um... jane so i remember i remember jane so ian ian curran jane curran was it was jane jane curran yeah who was at who was also at the same school maybe a year or two above uh, my year but yeah, she was she was lovely, and she used to hang out with another uh, sort of you know lovely looking girl as well. All the all the school like oh you know Jane Curran and uh, Joanne Evans. That's right, and uh, yeah, it's funny. Well, wow. let me find this. Going back there now. <laughs> <laughs> um, there we go. Family album. It's just... Man, that's that's amazing. You've really got the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> now you. I hope you're not too disappointed with what you see here, okay? Oh, look, oh, look at that. <laughs> yeah, so Ian, yeah, so there we go. I don't, I don't think I ever met. Oh, no, I did. I do remember the wife. I can't remember her name. Please tell um, me. But, tell so, me you met the dog. Yeah, was it, I think the dog was. Oh, well, mind you, he might. Yeah, I, don't, I, think I mean, this, this, was, this, this was back in 1973, this photograph, so... Yeah, so I would have been, that would have been 10 years on, but I don't know, the dog might have still been about, <laughs> but Ian, yeah, I remember, totally remember Ian, who's obviously grown up properly off from there, and Jane, wow, I think Jane, I don't remember the other daughter, but yeah, one of them is Jane, I can't, I can't even work out which Andrea, one would be Jane. Andrea's. What a um, mad picture. Yeah, so the one beside you is Andrea, she's seven at that point, Ian's six and Jane is four. Ah, okay. So that would make sense. So and Jane's the, the younger one behind Ian. Yeah, and the sheepdog's well, five months, so it may well have been that. Humphrey, <laughs> answers to yeah, the name hey, of Humphrey. Yeah, Humphrey, yeah. I think, he, I think <laughs> he was probably on his last legs and at the pub. I do I do <laughs> sort of remember a dog being around, I think. But, wow, how mad is that? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll send you this. I'm, I'm following you on Twitter, so I'll send it on to you. And you can... Thanks. Yeah, you. Wow. I think... I mean, it's quite sad because I think I saw the last time I saw Hugh Curran, I think he was working at the bus station. Right. I remember, I remember being on the bus going up to a London, the also London buses, and I remember thinking, God, I think that's Hugh Curran. I was pretty sure it was Hugh Curran working there, and I think he worked at a garage before then. It was, it just, I don't know, it just felt a bit sad to me because it's just like, wow, how, like it's a legend. I mean, mm -hmm. how, how did that one work out um, or not work out, or whatever? I mean, I'd be, I'd be, I guess at that time. Yeah, they they got paid pretty well players, but nothing like now, I guess. So, yeah, yeah once it's done, it's and, unless you've invested properly. I mean, actually, the place I'm in now, um, which, which is part of my studio, it the, the there's flats ne next to me there, it, sort of next to a mill. But they that's actually owned by Roy Burton's brother, who was Roy Burton was an Oxford United goalkeeper for years. So I think Roy Burton and his brother they maybe a bit smarter at that time kind of when i had a little bit of money invested in some of the properties around this area of oxfordshire um and and still own them so it was quite funny when i was sort of looking to sort of get this studio place i ran into Roy burton's brother who actually knew my, my late father as well so i was like oh wow, that's that's a clinch then i've got to be have a studio in here because it's like i'm surrounded by people who knew my dad anyway and like they've got the oxford united link as well so yeah, yeah. So, and a few years later, Mark, when you had the bands, did any Oxford United players sort of blag their way on the guest list or anything? Not players, um, but I remember we we blagged going to the Manor uh, to do an early interview. I think it was Snub TV right. or Rapido. Oh, no, maybe it was Rapido. Maybe Rapido. It's one of those two. I think yeah. I'm pretty sure it was Rapido. And um, they, because Steve in the band i mean he was a tottenham fan always was but steve also used to go and watch oxford as well quite a lot because 
you know, he was there and he was really into football. It was always me and Steve were the big sort of football guys in the band, really. And he is now, he kind of came to it a bit later. But, um, but so, I, yeah, and I remember there's, there is some footage with Pedo ride where we're kicking a ball around on the hello turf that was the manor um, and being interviewed in the stands at the, at the manor. Mm-hmm. Um, so, they, yeah, they were very cool about that. And I mean, also, I remember a few years on from there, um, Oxford United playing Chelsea in the FA. It's an FA Cup game. And we've basically beaten them until... Remember that the the big black guy Kevin Francis, who was just such long legs. He played for a few clubs. He was really unusually tall, and um, he basically made a fair tackle in the box on the literally in the last minute on on uh, Viali, who dived like. But this leg sort of literally came out of nowhere, and Viali just did the dive. And up until that point, we were basically going to knock Chelsea out, and then basically. Um, Viali stepped up, scored the goal, which took it to a replay back at Chelsea, where they hammered us, I think, three or four one. Um, but on that day, on that game, uh, Oxford were in severe financial trouble, and my dad was part of a team um, called F O U L, like Foul, um, and it's something like for Oxford United uh, League status or whatever to try and help pay the players at that time because they were in a really bad place, the whole club. So all the fans were kind of getting together to try and find things of worth to sell, to, to pump, put some money in the club. And I remember I walked on the, oh, I went back to backstage again or whatever it's called, back in, in the stand, having a couple of shots of whiskey. And I think even Jim Smith was there at that time. So I remember seeing a few people had a, had a big whiskey. And basically I, was, I went onto the pitch with one of my Rickenbacker guitars and sold my Rickenbacker guitar at half time, uh, you know, a lot of cheering that went on. And I was like, this is amazing. I'm at the manor. I've just gone on the, the hallowed turf that is the manor. And I sold a Rickenbacker for like two and a half grand. Right. And this, you know, this guy, this uh, dad and his son bought it. It's quite an over inflated price for that guitar at the time. But again, and that was that was sort of money then to help pay the players and just to keep the, the club alive at that point. Um, so that was a sort of another sort of big moment. But, you know, talk about you know, changes in fortunes over a few years. I mean, that, that would have probably been around about 93, 92, I guess. Yeah. So like I say, it was, it wasn't, yeah, if that's safe to say, yeah, five, six years on and it was a completely different picture. Yeah. yeah. Hey, all right. So we'll have a look at the rest of the magazine then. So <laughs> opposite page, there's a colour picture there of Terry Butcher. Terry Butcher. Yeah. Of Ipswich. And, wow. uh, on uh, an Ipswich shirt with a red band across it, the Radio Orwell sponsors, and the three uh, sort of horizontal pinstripe. Yeah, crikey, Terry Butcher, man. I mean, I need to switch. I mean, we're battling it out with Ipswich now in League One. Um, mm. So that's again strange how fortunes change. But again, I remember going to Portman Road back at the time. At that time, uh, another great ground to go and visit and tick tick off. Uh, Ipswich, big big club. At that time, that uh, was kind of posted. Was it Paul Mariner? Was there the yeah. striker for a while? Um, yeah, again, I remember it switched back in the day with the, the football cards, but yeah, big, big club. And um, yeah, look at a Terry Butcher. Wow. And I just, I look at Terry Butcher there and I just think about Terry Butcher when Maradona went straight past him at <laughs> <laughs> the World Cup. I saw one of the players that kind of was like, oh, where's he gone? <laughs> Um, yeah, but yeah, Terry Butcher. Wow, I'm, fascin- yeah. I'm fascinated by the size of the badge. It's, it's tiny. It's, it's it is tiny. Yeah. yeah, but again, great. I like. I love the um, the little. Uh, what do you call it? The side. Was it a horse over a water or something? Isn't it? And yeah. it's which uh, the badge, the club badge. I mean, I, yeah. again, I know I, because I've just watched, you know, studied football so much. I just knew all the badges, all the strips. Um, I used to buy various strips i mean that was not when i was a teenager before then i was sort of 9 10 11 i used to always sort of try and find uh, strips and buy them if, if i had the money or, or whatever mm. but yeah so kind of i do remember that but I didn't, yeah i didn't even remember butcher paying for it switch but yeah i suppose yeah there he is well you would yeah. have won the ufa cup with him yeah he did that's yeah. it yeah, yeah yeah of course wow you joined would, would... just not long after this well he's, he's in the right kit pretty much for rangers yeah. there almost anyway 
yeah. but yeah so of course yeah it went to rain as well yeah. Yeah, and, and go and tell him, Tom. A very brief spell with Clyde Bank. He came out. Of, he came out of retirement. He played for Clyde Bank, um, and then quickly went back into retirement. <laughs> <laughs> he was right. a few yards off the piece at that point. But yeah, but I mean, proper. I mean, in his day, what a what a centre back, amazing and proper old school, rough, you know, tough guy. And uh, and yeah, he had a bit of pace, but mm. yeah. I mean, obviously, he made the grade for England, yeah. I mean, I think the iconic image for me for him is in England top with the bloody band, you know, the band that's right. around his head. I mean, that, yeah. that's the iconic one. That's right. You, Yeah, you're right. And that's the other one you think about with, with Butcher. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. I've only cut my head open. Carry on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right, well, over the page then, uh, I think it's uh, Worldwide. So, uh, world, of, world of Soccer. And the headline there is... Oh, yeah. Axe Eder. Uh, this is World Cup favourites. Brazil have been rocked by internal problems, which have seen star winger Eder expelled from their squad. Uh, Eder was sent off during their 4 0 win against Peru for punching an opponent. And Telly Santana decided to sack him from his continual shows of indiscipline. Uh, do you remember Eder from the 82 World Cup? Yeah, I do. I'm thinking back to my running through my Panini sticker books there, uh, but. That was uh, so Spain eighty two, which was the one with Scott on oh, no, was Scott no Scotland were at Argentina, wasn't it? And then well, they had yeah, in Argentina and Spain eighty two and Spain. That's that's it, yeah. But yeah, I mean, and to be honest, I always used to if yeah if it's England Scotland, I you know yeah, I'd always be supporting whichever one was doing all right in the World Cup. Basically, I mean, with with the British teams, I mean, obviously England first and foremost. But I think on the seventy eight, I was you know rooting that. For Scotland and that amazing Archie Gemmell goal, which I remember watching with my dad, I was just like, "Wow, it was unbelievable!" And is it the Johnson that got sent home for doing yeah. drugs or something? Because I remember being young and thinking, "What's what's drugs? What's that? Like, what, what's he on there?" And yeah. um, so I do, yeah, I kind of have vague memories of that. Um, but yeah, there we go, Ada. I don't really remember Ada. He's got the great, he's got the great goal against against Scotland. Mm. Yeah. Okay, probably why is it sticks in sticks in my mind a bit, a wee bit, a wee bit more. But yeah. uh, it could be lying in there in that article. It says, uh, 28 year old forward shot to fame in 1982 when his bri- brilliant wing play and powerful left footed shooting made him a star of their World Cup challenge. But Eder has maintained a flamboyant lifestyle and is often seen in night- the nightclubs and bars of fashionable suburbs in Rio de Janeiro. Can you blame him? I mean, that's the, the Brazilian way, wasn't it? I mean, <laughs> yeah, of course. What else are you going to do? <laughs> there's, a, there's a bit of a theme through this magazine about that, though, about the drinking and. Sure, in, in the, in but the at football. that time, at that time, it seemed that I mean, I'm sure players still have a drink now, but at that time, it seemed more that I don't know, it just felt that people maybe were not quite as athletic as they seem to be now, footballers. Mm. And um, you've just got the feeling that I mean, I've got the feeling with Dave Lang or someone in Oxford as well. I mean, that maybe been in the had a pint before you know the game or whatever. I mean, they hadn't, but you know, you get, you get the feeling that some of them were, were big drinkers for sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, and what's that? Hammers? Is that Tony Cotty? Yeah, Tony yeah. Yeah, it's another page. I owe it to the boss. He's talking about John Lyle, his manager at West Ham. Wow, yeah. Oh, John Lyle, yes, yeah, right. It's manager then, yeah. And again, I'm at, yeah, out of Upton Park, went a few times with Oxford. Good, good games. I remember we always had good games at West Ham as well at that time. Did you have um, a favourite away grounds to go to, Mark? Um, you know, I've never went to Anfield. And I never went to Old Trafford, but I I remember at the time, I I loved Main Road. Uh, that was, I mean, like I say, because I kind of did, when I was a young lad before, I was sort of seeing Oxford, I kind of liked Man City, Dave Watson era, and Jenny Stewart, and uh, people like that. And, and I don't know, just, so it, it meant quite a lot to me going to Main Road at that time, because I, I don't know why, it just seemed like a big ground, and uh, I thought that was great. Goodison Park as well was was great and it's good that it's still pretty much the same as it was then i mean i just remember but i remember the uh the old scouts as being particularly gnarly <laughs> like, like, um uh, and, and yeah upton park was always good as well going to upton park i went there a few times um what other london clubs uh white Hart lane was, was okay yeah yeah uh, i don't know if had a favorite but i it was just great for me because i was just getting to tick you know, do my tick box of the, the grounds slowly but surely around, around the country. Uh, so, Andy, anything you've seen on? Well, there was the the Mexico Murmurs, um, which was 
There was a huge brawl in Mexico less than seven weeks before the World Cup um, between uh, was a, a couple of the teams there. I can't remember um, who it said. But it was like basically a bit of an embarrassment considering they were that close to the World Cup fight, hosting the World Cup finals. And then there's this big brawl going on. Was it? Uh, Champions Uruguay and Los Angeles. Oh, so this, wow. was, this was actually the Mexico team. Um, that were right. involved in in a in a big punch up, um, and that 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 was just something that went and um, stuck out for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go, Mexico. They were drinking as well, I'm sure. <laughs> just before we go, can, I'm just going to pick out the fixtures there. So the, there was an Ipswich versus Oxford game coming up, and Hearts played Clay Bank as well. And I've looked both up, and unfortunately, both our teams lost. So, oh, okay. Ipswich beat Oxford 3 2 and Hearts beat Claybank 1 0. So, yeah, not a And great... was that, would that have been, so that would have been league, a League One game at yeah. that time? Yeah, yeah, let's yeah. see, tw- okay. 26th of April, that was. So... Oh, so that was after the, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, okay, so that would have, that would have been worry. It was it squeaky bum time, worrying yeah. time if we were going to stay in the league or not. Mm. I guess at that point, that wasn't probably a good result for us. Yeah. So Jam, Jam Mulby, Liverpool. Yeah. Well, look at that. Yeah, you're talking oh, about you're talking, mullet, about how, man, how, um, <laughs> you're talking about how you're talking about how less than physical, um, you know, physically fit players were. And there's a picture of Jan Mulby just to back it up. <laughs> yeah, it's true, isn't it? The guys like now definitely seem more athletic. The training obviously has gone up quite. a few levels but yeah you, you, you I think that's the thing when you look back on older football you, that the you know there's there's definitely different sort of physiques should we say <laughs> um you know right you know because they, I guess guys were more themselves but they hadn't kind of done all the training as much training as that they do now or whatever they do gym work I don't know what it is but yeah. so, so which makes them a little bit similar in some ways I guess with physique but yeah there we go Moby he was, he was I remember he was a big guy he was a tough and pretty, yeah, he was really good as well. And it's his time. Yeah. And Johnson stayed at Celtic. Yeah, Johnson, he played he played in England as well, didn't he? Um, yeah, we, we didn't Watford first. Uh, that's it. Watford yeah. mid 80s and then later on, he was a uh, 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 Evan. Yeah. Proper mullet, proper nigga, uh, proper uh, mullet going on there. It's like, that's what we like to see. Yeah, Hi- <laughs> highlights as well. Mullet and highlights. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Like the, full, the, the full, full Monty there, full Mo. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, that's Morris Johnson declaring he's going to stay at Celtic uh, that time in 1986. And he did for a, for a season. He went on to Nantes the following season. Oh, and then Fergus All Hearts. Is that Alex Ferguson? What's that saying there? I can't quite see the. So Alex the, Ferguson thing. acknowledged the march of hearts towards the Premier League title when he included uh, Tyne Castle starts Craig Levine and John Robertson in his squad for next week's warm up match against Holland. So uh, Ferguson was a sort of uh, caretaker Scotland manager at that time. Wow. He died in uh, September 85. So, Ferguson so it would have been the following season that he took over at Man U, and that yeah. would have been the following season, and also beat them then on that game. Okay, that makes sense. Wow. The rest is history on that one. That's Ferguson. Wow, <laughs> Jesus. That, that came good. And soon, oh, soon as yeah, so the students, soon as silence is scoffing Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you don't you don't want to mess with Sunis, whatever, mate. <laughs> it's like, yeah. All right, whatever you say, mate. Yeah. But yeah, no, another yeah, great great player again. Um, yeah, I don't really remember Sunis playing for Scotland and obviously Liverpool. Um, brilliant, yeah. So yeah, this is, is, there, there is. Uh, are you going to pick out the Johnny Ekstrom one as well? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I have. Yeah, you want to do that, Andy? No, it was just because I think it was a sign of how how much in high esteem Ferguson was in Scotland at this point, that three of those articles all... I mean, the one on Mo Johnson mentions them because he's talking about not taking them with the Scotland squad, wasn't he? And then there's the one on Hearts, yeah. and then there's the one about Johnny Ekstrom, and it's just like... It's obvious at that point in Scotland how special yeah. uh, Ferguson yeah. is. Yeah. It's funny, that, isn't it? Because, like, football, like music in a way, like, ever since... I got kind of doing music. It was always, I was always sort of seemed to be Scots in charge, like McGee. <laughs> well, like I was, was like, going to get to that later on, Mark. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and looking at it now, I like the Scots. The, yeah, there's something about that kind of 
they, they made great you know great managers and they, they that sort of came but i mean obviously johnson i mean it's you know um crikey i mean yeah that like the the, the liverpool great as Shane, well yeah. i mean yeah, i mean yeah so yeah i mean that's it isn't it i, I that's why i saw that program with the jock steen um what was it the three three kings three, the three kings yeah, yeah amazing so good and yeah you just wow i mean they changed everything those guys i mean I, I, and i just didn't realize that, that what had happened with jock steen as well like that he had actually had a heart attack and one that game it's just yeah. so unbelievable i had no idea that went down now yeah 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 no it was shit every time it was shopping yeah yeah Okay, we move on, Andy, or is there anything else? No, no, let's move on. Ah, so, how good is Oh, that? wow, look at that. How good Pringle. is that? I know. There's a number. Frank McAvenny modelling the Scotland collections, a range of leisure, Scotland leisure clothing. <laughs> There's not a single item that I wouldn't want from that page. Everything, including those trousers of his. The, the <laughs> yeah. Model zone, I think. Yeah, man, that's like. Yeah, man, when, yeah. When I first saw the yellow top, I thought Pringle straight away, but like it's not, is it? It's like um, Umbro. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, there's a lot of. There's a big Scottish thing going on as well with this mag, isn't there? Mm. Don, yeah, Richard Goff. Dundee. I can't kind of remember him as well. Oh, because of here yeah, you've been playing for Scotland. So that's how I've seen him. Yeah, play, this yeah. is going to be Spurs as well. We're going about that. We're about that time or yeah. just after that. Okay. Yeah, I don't I completely remember do, that. Do, but... do you rec- did you recognise the model? Who is that? No, I don't really. Frank McAvenny. Frank McAvenny. Yeah. Oh, well, yes, yeah, Celtic and West Ham. West, West Ham. West Ham. That's yeah. it. He was brilliant. Yeah, I didn't. No, I didn't recognise him there with the old. Yeah. That, There's that a bit, bit of a mullet and highlights going on as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but you know, fair enough. I guess it's when the players started to realise, hey, we we fashion, we can do the fashion thing as well. Hmm. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, that's right, McAvenny. He was yeah, he was like big for a while, wasn't he, McAvenny? Yeah. Wow. I think when you, you were saying there about how there's there's a lot of Scotland stuff in here, and I think it's maybe because England weren't in Europe, and at that there, time, and there was more focus because you know Scottish teams were doing yeah. doing well, and the Scotland yeah. game was becoming. I mean, soonest was going to Rangers, and there was a, a lot of buzz about the place. But you're right. I mean, you'd expect that it'd be more. English adverts considering England would have been at that World Cup as well. Yeah, yeah, but then, yeah, but you're right. Like you say, if it's the, they're strong at that time, unless yeah, it makes sense that they're in there. I mean, especially McAvenny. I mean, look at that man. You couldn't you couldn't have another man modelling clothes like that, could you? Really? Seeing that, I, I, I seem to recall, and maybe, maybe it would have been in other magazines, but I'm, I seem to remember there would have been Brian Robson possibly and Gary Lineker. Doing similar adverts on this, so I think, I think there were yeah. England ones of it as well. It was definitely yeah. Gary, Gary Lineker and possibly Brian Robson. Yeah, that would that would make sense. Yeah, as well. And I mean, of course, at that time things started to get a lot better for England. So I've I've got this one in front of me. I won't share it just now. I'll send it on later. But it's Gary Lineker and Trevor Stephen is the are the the models, and it's pretty much. Very similar styles as there. It's the same sort of style of advert. And the wee boy at the bottom is exactly the same wee boy wearing an England top. So he's just in it for the money. There's no. Oh, there's, there you go. There's no passion <laughs> for him. <laughs> You're just getting used all the time, that one, yeah. yeah. He's a professional. He'll wear anything. Brilliant. Commemorative jersey, yeah, he's in, yeah. <laughs> There's good strip, though. The Scottish strip at that time looks great. Yeah, yeah. Really good. Really good. I like that. That's a, that's a good look. Yeah. Again, I'm. Uh, I've said many a time. I'm not a fan of the shorts. It was all all a bit high hoisted up high, wasn't they? That in those days. It's just the band, the yeah. blue band. I, I, I don't like that. Uh, I don't the like, band. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. The band is. Yeah, the band lets it down a little bit. But um, I like the uh, the tops good and the socks. I like. Mm. I like that. It's a good yeah. combo. Yeah. yeah, the bands never took off. I don't think any other side ever had that kind of band on them. Yeah. Sort of. I I saw. Yeah. Sorry, I, I saw a side. Uh, I'll look it out later on and don't know if it was in the Netherlands or something like that. There was a team in continental Europe, I'm sure, that had the exactly same shorts as this. So I'll look them out and then share wow. it with you, Tom. <laughs> the only other the only other team I've seen with them. <laughs> I was gonna say I don't remember seeing thinking strip yeah, I can't remember any others like that as well. Yeah. So get over the page then. The private life of Arsenal's Graham Ricks. And uh, 
Yeah. Either we spell as Oxford United manager, Marquee, two thousand four. He did. It wasn't wasn't very memorable from what I remember. It was a bit bit dodgy, really. Um, he had a bit of there's a bit of scandal going on around Graham, yeah, wasn't there? Yeah. Yeah. That that came out later on, but um, it it wasn't it wasn't great at Oxford, I have to say. Uh, but of course, you thought, oh, Graham Ricks, well, you know, it's an old Oscar guy, he could be good. But yeah, um, not good. But yeah, interesting. That's interesting. And who's that? John Walk, is it? John Walk, yeah. John Walk, yeah. That's another Ipswich. He was with Ipswich, wasn't he? Yeah. So yeah, so he's, oh. John Walk's just get uh, injured there, which I think some ruled out of the Scotland squad for the 86 uh, World Cup. Ah, okay. Okay, yeah. Because he again, I mean, he was good. You remember him being good, yeah. Well, I mean, what's what's worse than that? Well, maybe not worse than not playing the world in the World Cup. He only made thirteen appearances for Liverpool, and you needed fourteen to get a, a league winners medal. I see. Seriously. Mm -hmm. God, yeah, that's a bit of a tricky, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So unlucky thirteen for work, as the the article says. Ah, uh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Anything else you spotted there on that page with those wee stories? Yeah, on the, the Dave's diary. So there's a bit where it says about um, money was no object for Rangers in their quest to get Graham Souness as their manager. In addition to paying the new boss in excess of £60,000 a year, it will cost them £600,000 to buy out Souness's contract with Sampdoria and pay off Jock Wallace. £60,000 a year, which um, would have a lot, a lot of money back then, but just pales in comparison to the, the figures that get talked about nowadays yeah for sure yeah that's like nothing now is it but that is yeah it's a lot mm. well there's a wee, wee bit down there it says funny a lot of these Wimbledon players who else would have the cheek to find their managing director Sam Haman 30 pounds for wearing jeans on the team coach to coach <laughs> <most> recently <laughs> that's brilliant <laughs> Uh, over the page again. So uh, on the left hand side, then the official mascot of the World Cup, uh, PK. Uh, and again, there's a, there's a few wee kind of bits of tat for sale, like key finder, key uh, match finder. Football, and an Umbro World Cup poster set, all related to the World Cup, and a giant World Cup wall, colour wall chart. So the key finder does a beat beat. That's interesting. So how how does it? It's something you must. How do you, how does that work? It's then? the one that you whistle and it beeps. So the, oh, the, the, seriously? Yeah, the, the, there was there was a thing. <laughs> there was quite a a thing at that sort of time for the whistling key ring. That's yeah. quite advanced, isn't it? For, mm -hmm. that, for those days, I guess as well. It's pretty, yeah. Biggins, Biggins, um, yeah, Wayne, Wayne Biggins, Biggins. Not striker Wayne Biggins. Uh, he came to Oxford as well, right? I think Wayne Biggins. That's why I know that Wayne Big. I'm sure he played he had a little spell for Oxford. And at the bottom, we've got Jim. Jim yeah, Smith Jim Smith back. again. Yeah. Jim's king of clubs. So, uh, I, guess, I guess Jim Smith was really an Oxford United legend. Eh? He was a director. He managed the club more than more than once. Yeah, he came back and it was really difficult because actually he came back to try and save us when we were sort of falling out of the league into the conference. Um, it did, he just didn't quite come back in time, but we, we nearly scraped out. But um, that was a really dark time for it as being an Oxford United fan, sort of falling into the conference after. You know, I mean, that was really like after being up there and the slow tumble down into the conference and that was horrendous really trying to get out of that league that's really that's not easy yeah. um but that was the other time uh, the, the second time i was at Oxford united uh at wembley when we beat york with under chris wilder um we everyone knows now because of yeah. it's sheffield united or whatever but at the time but he yeah i mean that was incredible day for me tinged a bit of sadness because i knew my dad wasn't well at that time and uh my dad was like, well, if I'm going to pop my clogs, I'd like to know that Oxford's mm -hmm. actually back in the league. And um, so that was an emotional day for me, and it, and it happened. I mean, that was incredible. That was the – I mean, probably – yeah, the Milk Cup was unbelievable, obviously, that – that, but but for being older and realising how – just for the club's survival and mm -hmm. how difficult it was to get out of the conference at that time, that was incredible. Um, another incredible day at Wembley. There we go. Yeah, that's the set. That, and like I said, that's the second time I've been to Wembley with Oxford and seen them win three one. That's why right, it's three one again. And, and was uh, Chris Wilder's appointment kind of the turning point for things? He was back? good. Yeah, well, it took a while. Um, I think he came from Halifax or something like that. It wasn't. I mean, his pre Oxford, he wasn't brilliant 
sort of track record he got but he was great i mean he yeah he got it going and uh, I, I loved him i mean i loved him for getting them out of the league i thought he was i thought he was really good um for a few seasons he was he was great for the club and you know basically i'll always love him for getting us out of the conference yeah. and he was good yeah he definitely showed that he, yeah he was a, he was a good manager i mean i think after oxford he teamed up with alan neil who i think had also i think that combination of those two guys was brilliant because everywhere they went from from there was at northampton and then I guess onto Sheffield, they just just everywhere, you know, they two they just took teams to promotion. They were really good, great, great double acts. But yeah, I, I always respect Chris Wilder and what he did there. It was fantastic for Oxford, and I, and I liked him. I thought he was good, proper, proper sort of football manager. Fair play to him. That first season of Sheffield in Premiership, they were great. Um, but I think you know, COVID really, I think Sheffield really needed. I mean, every club does, but a club like Sheffield really needed uh, fans. Yeah. through the turnstiles i think to help them you know to sort of retain you know they were not helped at all by covid i think it's an incredibly difficult difficult task anyway but yeah yeah respect chris wilder well just um just touching on the, the jim smith there so he's getting presented a, a trophy and um, for visiting each of the 92 league clubs doing the 90 club 92 and you touched on it earlier on mark about yeah. um, you know, you're attempting to do, is that something you're actively doing or is it just something that you, you know, you're just saying, I'll just tick them off as I go? I was, I was a restless sort of, Sag, I'm a, I still am a restless sort of Sagittarian. So the tour in life at that time really suited me. And I was, yeah, I want, I mean, I realized there were a lot of grounds and a lot of places that, uh, that I wanted to see. So in the same way that music, you know, half of why I love music was that time, because it meant that I could travel and see places and the world or whatever. But, Certainly, that was the start of, um, you know, it really uh, kind of fueled that that appetite and that hunger to see more. And, and like I say, I was just travelling with to the away games at Oxford. And like I say, because at that time I was a kind of football geek anyway. So I, you know, I I, I knew about the grounds. I knew, you know, I'd, I'd read a lot about it, and it was just lovely to see them in that way, yeah. like there and then, rather than just match the day or whatever. And um, with with your club, yeah. So. So for sure, yeah, it was it was it's kind of it just put it all it all worked for me really well, yeah. Right, so over the page there's a wee bit with John Motson's Mexico Marvels, Fernando Gomez of Portugal, and there's a Steve McGarry drawing there of uh, Fernando Gomez and a couple of other players, Gerd Muller, Jimmy Greaves, Ian Rush. Yeah, John Motson was the man. He knew, he knew, he yeah. knows. Yeah. So so the yeah. artist the artist who's drawn this, Steve McGarry, we've had him on the podcast before as well, and he, he does a lot of artwork in these magazines um I, I don't think he's done john Motson a huge favor at that point unless john Motson <laughs> has gone through a double chin phase um but what what I like Motty. is on fernando gomez I, I love the just to be plastered above his eye so there must, uh, there, there must oh yeah yeah there, there must have been something at that point which was you know yeah. a little iconic thing about that you know the same way we spoke about terry butcher with the head so maybe that was something that that was a result of a challenge that he got up and got on with or something like that. I don't know, but I, I quite like that. Brilliant. That's brilliant. <laughs> and there's a wee bit, there's a wee sidebar there that says claim to fame. Mm. And uh, I'm going to suggest some of these are just completely made up. Made up. Uh, my dad is Nigel Worthington's milkman. My friend's sister's friend's dad is Howard Wilkinson. And my friend's granddad was once asked to be Liverpool's physio. That's David K. 11 of Abbeydale in Sheffield. Uh, the, the first the first one I love, I was nearly run over by Paul Goddard as I was passing the entrance to West Ham's car park. And then there's the one the one I spoke about earlier on. I'm the only person in my school who supports Fulham. It was that Gerald, oh, oh yeah, that's Gerald what you Pym. Said, yeah. Um, and another one, while riding through Highbury on his moped, my uncle nearly ran down Don Howe, who was out jogging. There's a lot of um, vehicle accidents going on yeah. here as well yeah it, it was, that was the time when there was yeah cars were a bit out of, you know everyone was a bit out of control there i'm supposed i bet some of them been drinking yeah <laughs> that that last one was the last one the one you said tom my dad your dad is nigel worthington's milkman yeah that's yeah. a good one yeah well they, they, <laughs> they go on to like um double down though didn't they and then double down again <laughs> yeah, so, that's good, yeah. yeah I, I don't did they get any money for this claim to fame thing no I didn't see you. No, I think they just get. I just 
just the fame of getting on claim to fame, I would think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, especially it's pretty... when it, especially when it's an obvious wrong or you know lie, yeah. basic lie. Yeah, let's try and make up a good good one here to get on there. Yeah, yeah. and I bet, but I bet whoever it was would be keeping these magazines now as well. So over the page again, Andy, I think we've got Graeme Soonis, yeah. So oh, there we go. Two pages. Graeme Soonis, welcome to Ibrox. So he'd just been announced as Rangers player manager, which was quite a surprise at, at the time. It was a big turn up. Having a, a player of that kind of class as well coming in was a yeah. big surprise. Yeah. And I suppose that's the game why remember him with Liverpool, um, tough player when we watched him for Scotland. And then obviously... We don't see him because he's then playing for Rangers, but from an English point of view, because mm. we we didn't really get to see the Scottish games in that way then. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a great. I mean, it's a cracking photograph, and the, the very fact that they've dedicated the the centre page, you know, two centre pages to this, just shows you. There how, we go. You know how yeah you know, much they were taking it um, seriously and that how is. important it was. Yeah, that is big. Yeah, well, he's a big, massive player at his time, wasn't he? It's mm. like. Yeah, but, you know, and he did all right with management for a while. He was alright. Yeah, yeah, he did. He did something to start with. He did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Over to you, Andy. Yep. Yeah, so we're going to jump out the magazine for a few minutes, Mark. And the first mm-hmm. thing we're going to, we're going to do a focus on. So you said you were a more of a reader of shoot magazine. So you'll be aware of the focus on features in there where they asked a, fo- uh, a footballer of the day the standard questions. So I'm just going to fire some questions at you and just give me your answers. So, okay. f- full name. Mark Stephen Gardner. Birthplace. Oxford. What was your first car? It was a dreadful uh, mini clubman. Which colour? Yeah, a little green, greeny, green with a little bits of wooden trim down the sides. <laughs> you know, like really oh, bad. Yeah. And yeah. it was always overheating, so I had to pee in the radiator tank and all sorts just to get, get that thing around. It's bad, bad car, yeah. Okay. Um, who's your favourite player of all time? Oh, God, that's a good one. Actually, for, for I'd have to say for someone that just gave me immense joy at that time would be John Aldridge, mm-hmm. I think, because of what he did at Oxford and how, yeah, it just that it blew my mind. And like I say, he was very kind to me when I had geography A-level questions for him about <laughs> re- relocating around. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I'd, I'd say John Aldridge, yeah. Okay, and just for the record, favourite team? Well, oh, it's it's always Oxford United, yeah. Yeah. What's the most memorable match? Well, I would actually, I'd prob- for Oxford, I'd probably have to go with the Oxford York getting out of the conference. A narrowly second would have been uh, probably the Milk Cup final. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. What's been your biggest thrill? It doesn't have to be football. I would say probably uh, headlining Primavera in 2015 was pretty massive uh, for for me at that time because also it was a time when I thought yeah we we just have kind of come back and uh, that was a uh, that was a big big um, headline for us big festival and incredible vibe so yeah. That, that's up there with, with it. it. It would have to be a show, and that's right up there, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, on the flip side, what's been your biggest disappointment? In life? Uh, yeah. Oh, man, there's so many, so many things that I can <laughs> disappoint. Um, okay, this season, we lost to Swindon. <laughs> <At home. laughs> okay. That was re- it's really disappointing, I have to say. It was... <laughs> Lockdown, COVID time, and and it's like, and we've just lost to Swindon uh, after beating them seven times in a row. So that was yeah, that was pretty. That was a dark point for for sure. Okay, okay. Uh, what's been the best country you visited? Um, India, okay. I, and that wasn't on tour. I'd I'd spent six months in India um, around two thousand and one. Um, yeah, and I, I was a time in my life where I could. I mean, I I was only supposed to go for a month. And it's the only time where I've looked at my return ticket and thought, I'm not, I'm not coming home. I'm tearing that up. And six months later, I was still in India. Hmm. And I, yeah, I finally did return, obviously, as I'm here. But, um, but yeah, India blew my mind. It's hmm. an amazing, amazing country to visit in that way. Okay. Let's see if this next question is related. What's your favourite food? Indian. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah. I, I live on, I mean, you know, simple fit. Yeah. I mean, actually, I love, I love flackles as well, but um, Indian, like dal and rice, I mean, I kind of, that's my sort of staple just for that, seeing that kind of old hippie or whatever. But I mean, I, yeah, I love just simple, so, uh, you know, earthy Indian food, like, you know, dal, rice, that sort of stuff is, is I love it. Yeah. Yeah. No argument. No arguments from me there. Miscellaneous like, mm. so give me two things that you like doing. But I like doing, um, it, well, I like it when music goes well and, you know, mixing and something that you've worked on and then it, you hear it on the radio or something. So that's, that's good. Kind of, I mean, an outside of the music thing, well, I like going to football. Um, and showing my age a bit now and with my name Gardener, I actually, I actually do like piddling around in my garden which is out, out the back there it's sort of the studio garden anyway which yeah. is something yeah something i find quite zen about doing stuff in the garden these days <laughs> okay so again on the flip side miscellaneous dislikes so give me two things that drive you up the wall uh oh man people dithering around um yeah like dodgy dodgy drivers uh just people bumbling yeah just like yeah that that is really that and and unpolite drivers you know where you pull over and let people go through and they don't thank you that's something a pet hate of mine that i hate yep. and, and i mean you know the more obvious ones just politics uh certain you know certain people like boris johnson or whatever i mean and just the important some people just i just don't get it at all um the whole brexit thing was to me just nuts so that that was two things that i think more recently they've totally yeah, i think we have me. a few on that yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah for sure yeah well i mean yeah i really feel for you guys on that one yeah jesus mm -hmm. christ so yeah just stuff which just doesn't seem to make any sense whatsoever and yet we we are supposed to sort of go along with it and you can't do a lot to change it okay yeah, so it's hit, sorry it's hit music pretty hard that eh? the, the, the brexit massive yeah i mean like it couldn't be hit any harder you know you've got spotify that people don't understand that you know they think if they're streaming you or you would see some money from that which you're not i mean it's, how can that work when people are streaming you and britney spears is getting money it's just bizarre that whole thing it's a shame and it, that just any little sort of percentage more percentage coming through to us it's artists would massively help uh the industry um which yeah and then you've got obviously the pandemic it's been an absolute nightmare for music because one of the last sort of uh streams of income was is live music for lots of bands and you really need that so that was wiped off and then of course you've got the whole brexit thing now where we can't properly travel within europe now with without carnets and i mean that's all just a big mess so it's like a sort of sucker punch as well um so yeah it's it's yeah tough really tough at the moment i mean you know we did okay so we're okay but i mean i've i really i mean i'm you know i'm working with other bands like the go express from manchester fantastic band just got um, B listed on six music and um, single up mixed here, fantastic. And I mean, it's just a total struggle for these groups or any of them just to um, be musicians and to sort of to you know craft you know to have time to do their thing because uh, it's just it's hard. And um, I think if you the, the trouble with that is you, you know people should and, and no one's being greedy here. You just need something just to kind of be able to sort of keep going. Mm. Um, and then you know then you'll have your next. Radioheads, you know, you have your next big bands, um, but I, I'm just worried that with what's going on at the moment, with with you know a lot of great talent that just can't function um, and can't continue in a way that you know you just, I guess you end up in the in the end with Jive Bunny at the end. You know what I mean? It's like unless unless things change, it's kind of it just sort of goes that way. So I think you know artists just need a bit more support. Um, and a, and a bit more remuneration than what they're getting at the moment. It's really difficult. Okay. Next question yeah. is: What is that your was my big big moan over? <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll we'll, we'll, go, we'll try and we'll try and um, move on to something a bit more um, light hearted then. Uh, fav <laughs> yeah. Favorite TV show of all time? And um, only, oh, you're only getting one. Only getting one. Okay. Well, in the era of box sets, Sopranos blew me away. Yep. Thought Sopranos was genius. Yeah. Okay. Uh, favorite singers? I will give you two. Give me two. Um, oh, man. Favorite singers? Well, Carl Wilson, Beach Boys. Um, and there's so, so many of them. Recent ones. 
that's crazy no, I, I just can't it's just so many I can't think of one that I would say oh yeah definitely um I should go I should go for female I guess so Kate Bush okay so I've done a male and a female yeah Kate Bush beautiful okay hopefully this one is next question will be uh, a little bit easier in terms of I mean it's, it's still one of those questions favorite actors I'll give you two again favorite actors uh Woody Allen I mean just for for, for cracking me up <laughs> um and yeah john cleese as well yeah. you know like 40 towers things like that i just think with with classic at that time yeah. and Mont monty python and stuff brilliant yeah i mean just in life of brian and things like that he's yeah. he's, he's outstanding yeah he's absolutely outstanding yeah. okay yeah. who's your best friend <laughs> he's my best friend that's a good question <laughs> <laughs> um uh, my best friend uh well i suppose got to be Andy really through the thick and thin of it all given someone that from since school onto what we did with the band and everything yeah I just, I just, I just got to say Andy Bell okay who's been the biggest influence on you uh probably my uncle when he was alive back in the day I mean he he's the guy that steered me towards music his name is Robin Gardner and uh, that's my dad's brother hmm. so he, he sort of steered me into the music way so he he was a big influence on me okay uh, final question yeah. Which person in the world would you most like to meet? They'd be dead now. Although they are dead for sure. But I, I'd like. I, I don't know why I was wanted to meet Laurel and Hardy. Right. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, and I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll let you away with sneaking in that as as a, as a double as well. As a so, two, yeah, 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 as a double act. Yeah. <laughs> Great stuff. Okay, <laughs> listen. Thank you for answering those. Back to you, Tom. Yeah, so just to stay with you a wee bit, uh, Mark. Before we go back to the magazine, you touched on it a wee bit earlier on. I was just going to ask you, going back to the early days of Ride and working with Alan McGee at, at Creation, how that was. It, so it strikes me that you had a lot of freedom at the, at the time to make music, mm. with no pressure on you, you had singles, you had EPs that were, that were coming out and all four tracks were as strong as each other. And then you had an yeah. eight minute single. Uh, how, was, how, was, how was that working with McGee at Creation? I mean, so Alan at that time for me, and still is really just was kind of like a, a family in a way sort of a, a kind of bit of a mad uncle and and the, the the great thing that alan did which is why he was really clever um, but also why he had to take some time out was he he probably got to know his artists so he he sort of famously says i signed people not bands in that way so but by him doing that it, it meant that he could then trust uh his artists to leave them alone and know that you know what made them tick and what 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 he needed to do and what what they needed to do and then he also knew then because he knew us that well that when we were running into trouble i.e like when we burnt out our first engineer or you know things would you know when we're like who's going to mix this record now and you know when when we really need someone to sort of step in and help he was there always there and and brought in great people uh, because he was because he was that close to the band at that time so it was key for for ride uh i mean we loved we already loved you know the, obviously the valentines um house of love um primals as well i mean uh, you know early those early bands that were connected with creation um so as soon as mcgee sort of showed interest it was it was a done deal really we we i, I just thought creation was the coolest sort of label i mean creation for AD, i thought at that time were great like mute were great as well but they independence were really strong then yeah. I just thought McGee was just a great character. And like I say, I just had some good, really top nights with him um, early days. And he, yeah, he he was very good at taking a, a guy that was me, which was a very sort of naive, stupid sort of pretty boy, art student kind of guy that thought he knew it all or whatever, but I really didn't. But he really educated me with a lot of music and really helped sort of mould me into a guy that was going to be good to... Yeah, to to be front in a great band that, that Ride was at that, you know then as well. So yeah, I, I mean, it it yeah, there's there's a big creation massive in a way, at, and and why you know they were great because they like I said they they left they let us do our thing. I mean, we we just wouldn't have worked on a major or where if we were if we were with a label where people were kind of coming in saying no, you can't put penguins on your cover. You need to do, you know 
it just wouldn't have worked. I mean, that was the thing as well, obviously, because you those great record covers that had flowers on it, and that, like it wasn't mm. banned, weren't featured, there was no photographs of you on the record sleeves. So. No, we liked to keep it pretty ambiguous at that time, and we we put the the song titles in circles to so that people couldn't really work out what the A side was. I mean, probably yeah. because we couldn't work it out, but also, and to be honest, that's to a label, that's an absolute nightmare. <laughs> I mean, that that's like marketing and all that stuff. That's a total nightmare for a label because it's like. That's the worst thing to do, really, because they, they need to know what you're focusing, what single, and they were great with it. You know, they really were. And and we, we kind of created, at that time, created our own environment through doing that. We, we, we were not playing any sort of commercial games whatsoever. In fact, doing everything against that and not helping ourselves in that way at all. But as a result, I think people, you know, got into the band and believed in in the, the spirit of it and the environment of it as well. It, it kind of felt, it felt, authentic in that way um because it was and like i say and creation let us be us and and those people and yeah of course we made mistakes and you know we learned from that but you you know you need a label that's going to let you do that and um and and again with us like oxford united it you felt indie and then when you start to end up on top of the pops and you know like you know and then like oxford end up at wembley it feels even better because you're just feeling that that you're doing it on your own terms you know we didn't play any games to do that it was just just purely you know we just felt we weren't really right to be there either in a way which which again just feel like complete outsiders but but we were always surrounded by scots at that time the creation was was really it's a strong scottish thing going on there um and and again mcgee was definitely on the on the charge um at that point and we were to say an early band for him that kind of got in the charts for creation and uh sort of help set them on, on their way as well um yeah. i think so, yeah. his bookie effectively poached you from someone else someone else played them he did the demo and... yeah because we, we'd got warner brothers were courting us at that time or taking us out for the odd dinner and they were helping us to sort of get our first single made but i, I remember cali his name was cali he was a great guy as well but they, and we really liked those people but we just were not sure about the bigger labels that were around them like warner brothers and stuff so but he, I think he famously, I think Jim Reed or someone maybe had alerted Alan to, a, a, you know, about Ride is what we'd heard. And then, um, and then I think McGee had spoken to Callie and Callie made the fatal mistake saying, I'm going to sign this band Ride, who are great, uh, rather than I've signed them. And at that point, McGee then just, we were playing with the Soup Dragons. There we go, Scottish again, Sean, great guy. And uh, we were doing a tour, a big tour, because they, they just put out I'm Free and the, yeah. things were going really well for them. And uh, so Sean also got to know about the band really early on. He was really finger on the pulse guy. Right. And we were really noisy and pretty nuts then. And uh, he, he he loved it. So Sean was like, right, you, you guys come and support us. We're doing this big tour. And so, so and, that, and that was the tour then that McGee literally just kind of, well, he, he, he just kind of came from one show to another. And yeah, I'm like, yeah, you're right. He... he poached us basically but it although we none of us never even understood what he was talking about after the shows because he was the scottish accent was so strong we kind of felt he really likes the band i think he wants to do this and and to be honest he didn't have to say anything because the roster and the people that he'd got on his label just spoke you know volumes for him anyway so it was it was a no-brainer for us that it was creation yeah that's it all right, so we did go back into the magazine, then we'll try and get get through the magazine. Um, okay. So, want a mix mix mail bag? The star letter is fax chairman can't ignore. And it says Oxford United, Wimbledon, and Wigan Athletic are three of the more recent additions to the football league, and all have proved their worth. Fact: Following their second and third division title triumphs, Oxford reached the Milk Cup final in their first season in Division One. And uh, the letter goes on to talk about how well. Wimbledon and, and Wigan have uh, Wigan have done as well, and then who knows yeah. who knows then where the likes of Altrincham and Telford would be now if they'd replaced some of the dead wooden Division Four. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah, exactly. And there's Gary Lineker on there as well. Again, I can't quite see the text, but what's what's he up to there? So that's uh, a letter that's came in from um, uh, William Hesselton of Worthing with uh, here's my football top ten, and number one was Super Trooper Gary Lineker. <laughs> It's a bit, t- it's a bit tenuous. Number four was <laughs> yeah. a kind of ma- magic Zico. Wow. You there find the letters there, uh, Andy? Yeah. So it was from Andrew Johnson of Scarborough. Writes in, I'd like to congratulate Katie Dixon on her nice little Erna. 
I noticed that she got the tenor uh, award for the letter about Steve Perriman in March and also received the Star Letter Award and a similar reward um, from a rival soccer magazine. So she's obviously written into March and Shoot at the same time with the same letter. Got them both <laughs> printed and won the £10 prize in both of them. So well done to her. Yeah, yeah well done. Yeah, clever. Yeah. Um, the, <laughs> the, other, the other one was... Um, uh, how, how long? So this is from Alex Fine, I think, it's from Sturbridge, and he says, "How can John Robertson of Hearts be Scotland's hottest property, as claimed in match, when his marks and the match facts each week suggest he is off form?" And basically, um, Match's response to that is that the correspondents are typically Scottish and giving tight responses, tight um, numbers for that. So. Yeah, there we go. There we go. That's the two that yeah. I picked out from there. Over yeah. the page then. Uh, so match superstore. So lots of adverts there for uh, programs. Did you collect programs, Mark? Did you get a program of the game? And... I did. Uh, well, I didn't have to because my dad always bought programs, and he had we had piles of Oxford United ones, which went back for years. Oh. And um, actually, in the end. He, there was a guy called Martin Brzezinski who wrote the sort of history of Oxford United, quite a big book. Um, yeah, sounds funny, big book. It was, you know, but very, uh, like he went into everything. So he he actually, my dad just re- I remember the attic was just full of programs were everywhere. And I used to go through them a lot and uh, it's great. And he always used to write the scores on the back and, you know, subs. So it was always, that's with his fountain pen or whatever. So, in the end, I remember that uh, Martin Brzezinski kind of came and he, my dad passed them all on to Martin, who wrote wrote this sort of this Oxford United book. So um, probably a good time to go to. And I think Martin still has them. And yeah. So, but yeah, he we. So I, I mean, I did used to buy the odd program as well. Um, but like I say, most of the time, I knew my dad would would, would always got the code. I used to like buying the away programs when I went to the away games, and I'd kind of give them to my dad anyway. So. Yeah, but yeah, programs, that's quite a thing. Yeah, it's good. So uh, anything else you've, you've seen there, Andy? There's, I don't know if there's Yeah, the, there's a 64-page colour brochure. They call it a brochure for some reason, with details of Northern Ireland squad, timetables and photos of opponents. So the, there's an advert in there for um, basically a, a book for the World Cup coming up, which um, I'm guessing, you know, something like that wouldn't have been that, common for northern 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 irish fans certainly not in the magazine like this um, yeah yeah there's there's, wow. there's there's a greeting section there which i, I quite like the the first one says um a happy birthday to paquito and from love from mum and dad and he's a he's a man united supporter and then the next one is probably the most man united name i've ever seen his name's carrington neville that, that's that's <laughs> yeah, his name, and, and it's, that's somebody else that he's getting wished a happy birth, birthday from from mummy. Carrington Neville, yeah, that's great. That's yeah. very man you, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Given well the ahead of Neville it, brothers. Yeah, well yeah, ahead of couldn't... its time. Um, yeah, yeah. So, wow. so the next four pages after that are World Cup Warriors. This is Mexico '86, and there's a feature on Belgium, and then a feature on uh, Morocco. Belgium, first of all. So there's a. I can't recognise any of those guys. Belgian team group. What do you what do you reckon of that uh, strip there? That white shirt with the uh, the red and yellow mm. band across the top, the red diamonds. Not not great, is it? I mean, it's all right. I don't know. It's kind of yeah, it's a bit postmoderny sort of. Nice, quite nice colours, but yeah, Belgian. Yeah. I don't know. I think I think of Belgian in the sort of red shirts, really. But yeah, it's all right. I, th- I think they had a, a, a red equivalent yes. of this. Yeah, but um, right. I think, yeah, I think, that's I, right, with the yellow, yeah. yeah, maybe the diamond, yeah, it's not bad, not bad. I think what you mentioned there is, I think the colours make it work. I th- I think yeah. I, that wouldn't yeah, happen. they do. It wouldn't work for many other different colours, I don't think. No. But, but that, Belgium, goal, that, I mean, yeah. that goalkeeper top all... for me is a classic, absolute classic goalkeeper top. Yeah, so yeah. A two-tone, diagonal blue and light blue stripes. Um, they I, seem to be everywhere. And I remember if anyone was going to buy... A goalie kit, it would be like that, and they'd also have the, like, the big Sondaco Sondaco gloves, the mm. big grippy gloves as well. Yeah, yeah so yeah. he's he's, probably, he's got it got it right there. Yeah, totally. But an, an, another case of the goalkeeper being possibly the smallest player in the team. 
<laughs> yeah, that's not quite right, is it? Yeah. It, it does, doesn't he? That's, that's and, it, it's I short. Mean, I mean, he's trying he's trying to gain a few inches with that perm as well, but it's not really it's not really coming <laughs> off. I'm, I'm not even going to attempt the Morocco squad to start looking at the Morocco team. Well, the the goalkeeper is the total opposite in this one. Um, yeah, he's by looking farther. pretty tall. Yeah. Or it looks like they're on a slope or something. What's going yeah, on there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a bit disorganised, that team. It is a bit. They do look a bit. Even the team looks a little bit shambolic. He's not even one of the guys not even looking at the pitch. The other one looks like he's just smoked a big one <laughs> in the front row. I mean, and, and, uh, interestingly, they don't even have a badge on their kit. Mm. Oh, God, um, I hate to say it as well, but the, the trainer guy in the back by the goal, he looks a little bit like the Yorkshire Ripper. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Uh, him, him as well, yeah. Is, yeah. Bloody hell. But the saving, grace of this, the saving grace of this team photo is obviously the football, the greatest football of all time. <laughs> the Adidas Stango. Stango. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Without doubt, without doubt. But yeah. do you know, I said that the this was what I noticed earlier on as well. I said that they don't have a badge on their, their kit, but the tracksuits have a badge. And I just yeah. think that's... Dude, it's just Adidas, isn't it? It's Adidas, yeah. yeah. No, oh, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. The, the, the trainers do, but the players don't. They've just mm. got the Adidas logo. Weird. Maybe they're, they're just cutbacks or something. They're like not... That's weird, isn't it? Why wouldn't they have a badge on the kit? Yeah. Strange. Yeah. Let's just let's just call them an emergent nation at that point in, in <laughs> yeah. the world of football. There, there we go. There's the Swindon. Oh, so, no. So that's move that's on quickly. <laughs> for promotion. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, Lee Macari, that's right. And next, next to him. Um, do you recognise next to him? Yeah, that's... Um, I, can't, I can't see it, but that's... Uh, what's his name? I can't... This, Chris Kamara. On this. Chris Kamara, Kamara, that's yeah, right, Kamara. yeah. Wow, who are, who's a pundit now? I see him on mm. telly quite a lot, yeah. And but I that's think, right, Chris Kamar would have been at Swindon as well. Bloody yeah. hell. And standing behind him is Colin Calderwood doing that rabbit thing. <laughs> the, oh, the there we go, Behind yeah. somebody's head. God, yes, yeah, so I do remember that now. Makari back at Swindon. Super Swindon pays tribute to Lou Makari's man who became the first English league club to clinch promotion this season. Wow. You know, we're just going to cut that bit where you say Super Swindon and we're going to post that. I'll never be able to go back to the <laughs> castle again. It's like, I'll be hounded out of town. No, I mean, <laughs> Swindon, dreadful, dreadful place, dreadful team. There we go. Yeah, we can, we can move on on that one now. I think it's enough, enough Swindon. All right, last <laughs> couple of pages we're getting, we're getting into now. So match readers meet the stars. So there's an Everton fan coming to meet Graham Sharp. Uh, and Graham Sharp, yeah, of course. Ev- yeah, Everton, and yeah. Wow. What ever happened to Graham? Oh, and Ch- is that Charlie Nicholas? At the Charlie bottom? Nicholas, yeah, at Arsenal. It was Charlie Nicholas, David Rowcastle, and Graham Ricks. And they're all sporting like a trendy uh, Nike sort of rain jacket. Mm. Yeah, yeah, they're all pretty speaks. good there. Charlie that's Nicholas, another, that's another Scott, isn't it? I mean, he, yeah. yeah, he was good. Is he wearing shorts in that um, photograph, or is that like the oh, bottom skirt. of the jacket? It's like a mini skirt. <laughs> What's going on there? That's the new, it's a new look. <laughs> Charlie's got his wow. classic mullet with the, the wee perm bit at the back. It's <laughs> brilliant. Yeah, that's good. Sharp though. They're great, great, great striker. I mean, most yeah, for Everton now. He's well. close to the European Cup winners' cup that Everton won really the good. season before. Brilliant. Uh, yeah. So, there's match facts there. I don't know if you've seen any. I never really pulled out any interesting results. From the, the, the match there was facts. one game that I picked out, and it was from the 16th of April, 1986, and it was Division 2, I think. Uh, Bradford nil, Wimbledon 1. Sanchez, after 22 minutes, abandoned after 32 minutes. And it took a bit of digging, but apparently mm. it was abandoned due to flooding. It was uh, torrential rain that, that called that off, so... Oh, at Bradford. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was replayed. I think Wimbledon won the replay. Um, but yeah, it was just strange seeing a band. You know, when it says abandoned, you, it could be for anything really. So, so that this would this would have been, I guess, at Odzo. I think they were playing at Odzo Rugby Stadium yeah. um, at this point. Right. Okay. So the fire. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Again, that was another one that was that, you, that sticks in your brain. Yeah. Sort of. Where you're just like, what? How how can that happen at a ground? Yeah. But of course, yeah, you don't even think about it. Yeah, I and mean, what was it? Just so they'd left loads of um, 
leaves or paper and stuff. Yeah, there was the, a build up in... rubbish underneath the stand. I think they, they found things from like 1965, the, the dates on them, where there was a build up of rubbish underneath. And wow. the theory was that there was a, a dropped cigarette in, in the stand. Uh, oh, that it fell down, a, fell down a hole. The stand was apparently due to be demolished like that closed season. So it only had a few more hours to go and it was getting pulled down. Just horrendous, yeah. Uh -huh. just can't, yeah. Wow, yeah, I mean, that, that, you're right. That was, that was, yeah, not around that time. Yeah, another one that stuck in the head, yeah, for the yeah. wrong reasons, yeah. Yeah. Wow, much facts, look at that. All right, so I think we're just going to the last page now. It's a picture of Tony Gale of West Ham and what I think is a really nice West Ham kit. So we there we Nice. Start? Yep. Yeah, they've got the cut in the side of the shorts. Nicely done there. Remember remember that? Remember those big old snips that snip out? <laughs> yeah. But um yeah, yeah, that's that's a good that's a good look. Good kit. Proper. Yeah. But yeah, a nice a nice kit. Like a white shirt with an half cool. I had a few mates at school, a couple of mates. My, who were big West Ham fans as well, and, and in fairness, his family were all West Ham kind of guys that that originally came from East London into Oxford. So Paddy, his name was Paddy Curtin, good good pal at school. So always sort of respected West Ham, and I was kind of also aware that it was quite a tough and rough sort of club as well. Mm -hmm. Fans were pretty you don't mess with West Ham a lot. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, and again, I sort of see West Ham as a sort of you know proper club again. Yeah. Um, yeah, and actually, we always had good matches against West Ham in the day, and even carrying on, you know, sort of even to more recently, I think it's always, always really good games with West Ham. Lots of West Ham has been some great games over the years. There we go. Did great this season, bloody hell. There right, we are. Let's go to the end of the end of the magazine. That's great. The charity partner this season is the West Dumbartonshire Community Food Chair. This is a charitable organisation that provides various services and support to the local community, including the following. A school uniform bank, school holiday brunch bags, food provisions, Christmas toy bank, cooking and growing lessons and a baby bank. They provide essential support to the local community in supporting individuals and families, and we will be looking to support them in any way we can through the podcast. This will include drives for donations of food, money and support in the form of volunteers, we will also be raising awareness of the group to highlight the work that they do, but also to ensure that families and individuals who can benefit from the group are aware of these vital services. You can follow them on the West Dunbartonshire Community Food Share Group on Facebook or westdunbartonshirecommunityfoodshare.co.uk for the website. And that's West Dunbartonshire with an N. You can also donate through our Just Giving page for the charity at justgiving.com forward slash fundraising forward slash shoot the breeze one word. Also keep an eye on our Twitter accounts at shoot tb underscore podcast and at Scott's Footy Cards for updates and news on our charity partner. We'd like to say a special thank you to Pete Wiley of the Mighty Wah for the use of the story of the blues in the music for our show. You can catch up with Pete on petewiley.co.uk where you can check out the details of upcoming gigs and new music. We'd also like to thank our producer, Diane Jarden, for her great work and support on the podcast. Please check out transmissionroom.co.uk, where you can book music recording and rehearsal facilities in Clydebank. Right, and uh, can you tell us a wee bit about your, uh, about your studio, Martin, and some, some of the bands that you're, you're working with? Yeah, so... Um... Recently, the most recent band I had in on, I love them, is uh, the Go Express. Uh, that was my first sort of session after lockdown. Um, so I, actually, I, I mixed a couple of singles of theirs, um, which uh, Lamaca put them into Abbey Road. And um, they were it was kind of like ones to watch, kind of a band like that. And they're, they're Burnley, but Manchester based now. So they've kind of, they've all got the mad for it, Manchester thing. And um, brilliant. I mean, they've really, they've got just just a great gang of lads and just great vibes, vibey people to have around. And um, great, great singer, great, great writer. All the band's great. So it's funny, they just keep coming out of Manchester in that way. But I think, yeah, that was great. It was great working with those. And I've just, I've just finished, well, we, we, I did a session with them here. We, we recorded three tracks and I'm, I've just got the third track to mix. Um, I'm also um, doing a soundtrack 
for a documentary on Mike Chapman, the legendary Australian producer that amongst many hit records, he did all the kind of uh, a lot of the glam rock stuff. Um, and then also, you know, the knack, uh, and went on to do like Blondie Parallel Lines um, mm -hmm. and then went on to write uh, Simply the Best, Tina Turner. Okay. So that's a hell of a story Like he properly was, you know, still with us, a great guy and really amazing story. It ties a lot of stuff together. So I'm doing all the incidental soundtrack music around that, um, around all the sort of big hits that people will know. And it's just one of those you think this guy did, you know, you just it just ties so, so much together because it's Chapman and Chin and they obviously were dealing with mickey most and um, in the early days and just so many hits and brilliant yeah so that's going to be keeping me busy soon um uh the ride boys will are coming in on wednesday again so hey. that's nice so they you know we sort of feel that we've got a, a space we can use here because this this studio is still fairly new i mean it's this extension bit was only finished uh during the last lockdown so um yeah uh and so you're just gonna see in. what happens sort of you get plans to the call yeah we, we they've been they came in before after uh, actually after the go express session then the ride guys came in and we, yeah we just had a couple of weeks just to sort of reconvene and just sort of just kind of start a game really wipe the slate clean and it was it felt good just jam around a bit and just you know just i've given so much time that we spent apart and you know with the whole lockdown thing it's just yeah. nice just to sort of start to get to know each other again and sort of think, you know, just feel that we've got some time in a way now to kind of, and a space where we can just mess around a bit really and see, see what comes of that um, in the same way that we did when we sort of started. So nice. yeah, we'll see. So that, that feels pretty good. Um, other bands in, I've got uh, Magic Seas. Uh, I just worked with a, a local lab, a lad called Tom Weber, who's great, so quite villainy um but he's yeah he's good um but yeah i mean I'm, I'm busy which is good and i you know scraped through the whole lockdown thing it wasn't easy but got through probably not the best time to sort of finish building and building a, a recording studio but there you go i mean it's it's all passion driven this sense rather this this life rather than common sense in a way but that's you know <laughs> that I've, I've, it's worked out before and i'll, I'll get through but no look, i'm I'm happy and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm busy doing what I like doing and that's sort of music. And, you know, I must say also Oxford this season, really great. I mean, league one and they were back in the playoffs. So that's two, two uh, seasons in a row. We got into the playoffs um, league one and, you know, we're, we're battling it out still, you know, against your, your, your Portsmouth's, your uh, Ipswich, Charlton's, Blackpool, Sunderland's. Um, and yeah, great. I mean, they kept me very entertained again this season. So, you know, that's great. Uh, you know, and again, you really needed that. I mean, it's a bit weird. The eye followed me at first, but I kind of got into it after a while. So, okay, well, the players are giving it a go. And um, yeah, I thought, I mean, at first it's so strange. Like, how the football without fans? That's just not right. Yeah. But then, you you know, I'm glad that it adapted. And you just, I just think we all really needed other things to sort of focus on through yeah. what's been a really tricky time for everybody. Um, so thank goodness the football carried on because that, that just was a great relief. I mean, and I think that's the thing for me. I, I don't need, I'm, I wasn't a man that needs lots of sort of pleasures in that way outside of the studio thing. But when those things disappear, I mean, I, you know, I like to obviously take my family out occasionally for a bit of food. I've got a daughter who's seven. Um, so she sort of runs me a bit ragged, but I like to obviously see them as much as I can and take them out. And then I used to like to go to the, the football game. I've always been a season ticket holder at Oxford. So when those things are suddenly not there and taken yeah. away, then it is, it's weird because it's yeah. like you, you suddenly realize how much those things, just little, those times, it's just little things that you did like that meant and, and that you needed them. So when, when those sort of little pleasures were, were gone, I mean, it's definitely pretty dark at times. I mean, it's a great space, but being here alone a lot over the last uh yeah a few months was really, really tricky you know testing at times for sure but you know luckily like i could say a lot of remote work and coming in mixing work mastering work a lot of master oh also yeah the, on the scottish thing I've, i mastered charlie clark's album uh, late night drinking which alan mcgee is putting out on his creation 23 um label and uh fantastic brilliant artist he was he was uh, charlie clark was in astrid and uh i mean the 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 album's brilliant and it's great it's mcgee was came back in here 
last year. So it's great to, that Alan came into the studio and he's like, wow, you know, it's like, you know, you're really like a producer now, Mark. You're really like doing it. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. If you... Actually, I've been doing that longer than I've been in bands, but, you know, it's sort of, but it was great. It's great having Alan in here. And like, and I think he actually changed the, the working method of, I think, creation uh, 23, I think, was just putting out singles. And then when Charlie Clark's album came along and, of course, McGee is there, still finding, still finding great stuff. Um, he then made it Creation Baby, is it? And now, and, and that was one of the first albums he's put out on this mm. new sort of Creation label. So, and it's it's well worth a listen. It's brilliant. Charlie Clark, fantastic. Okay. Um, oh, and Kundalini Genie as well, another Scottish artist that I work with for, in Glasgow, who I, I mastered his single, and that's uh, absolutely brilliant. Um, Pennies by the Pound, Finnish sort of prog rock band. I mastered their album. That's fantastic too. Um, but yeah, so quite a bit. So it's all coming back to me now. <laughs> but yeah, quite, quite, quite a bit of stuff. Yeah, I know in the Gortsy Lee Street Choir, I've been working with the mastering a lot of their tracks, and they're starting to put stuff out. So yeah, it's good. There's, there's plenty going on. So just with that, Mark, we'd like to thank you again for giving us your time and all these um, Oxford United memories. I hope you've enjoyed it. Pleasure. Yeah, thanks. When you, you, you took me down memory lane in a big way there, so it's just some very happy great times for sure and i mean they're, they're always going to be up there with the best times sort of moments yeah. of my life really i mean it's that's that's how mad it is you know so it's great good to revisit and good to talk to you guys thank you for listening to the podcast and as usual please subscribe share it amongst your friend uh, check out the web page that comes along with the podcast as well where we share the the magazine that we've went through basically just keep enjoying it give us some feedback until the next time let's shoot the breeze Pete Wiley, how did that come out? That's random. I met Pete. We, we met Pete. Yeah, we met Pete a few times back in the day and brilliant guy. And that, that tune is absolutely superb. Yeah, brilliant. Great, good choice for a tune. It's brilliant. It's a brilliant tune.